Hi, I'm Nate Adams. Welcome back to HVAC 2.0 onboarding. So we have finally made it to the point where we can talk about load calculations and how they're kind of a crazy art and science. So we touched on them in the principles, talking about sweet spots. There will be a couple of slides that show up in here. Uh, this slide deck uh, it, I'm calling it Introduction to Load Calcs because it, this is helping you think about load calcs in uh, what we think is a more appropriate way. So it doesn't mean it's the right way, but this is the way that we do it in 2.0. And considering that we care a lot more about accuracy of load calcs than anybody else that I know, we're probably pretty close to right. So um, hopefully this slide deck will be really helpful to you for that. Um, and it, as you go through this, don't worry about getting it all on the first go around. So for two reasons. One, you're probably going to need to watch this one again. And two, the different tools that I mentioned in here, uh, I'm going to have videos on most of them uh, that are much more detailed in how to use those tools the right way. So uh, don't freak out too much about taking all of this in. Just try and let it kind of somewhat go over your head and just try and get the, the feel for it and then go back and start digging in. Uh, because this is probably going to be fairly different from what you have thought about in the past. So, and this chart here uh, was one that we developed for the Comfort Consult report a while ago, and note how big of a swing there is in load calcs. This is looking at the same house, and these are realistic numbers that we've seen. So you can look at a house and without knowing anything about it, the load might be two tons and the load might be six. So it's a huge variance um, and we'll dig into that. So this is what I originally called it, uh, called it quick and dirty, but accurate load calcs. Um, and this is what we're going to go over. So we're going to talk about how smaller is better when it comes to HVAC because of mean radiant temperature, which is over half uh, of human comfort is based on surface temperatures around us. We'll talk about the plus or minus 70% brouhaha that happened. It's been over a year now. Um, uh, but uh, why I said that, it was meant to be mostly a joke, but I'll show you can get in that ballpark. Um, and then we will go over real world load calcs, as I like to call them. So you can do a calculation. Or you can go look at actual data from how a system is running and understand what needs to happen. So we'll look at that uh, coming at it from energy use, from runtime charts, and from expanded performance charts. So a couple of different methods. Uh, all right, so smaller is better. So I, I love the whole everything's bigger in Texas. Uh, but unless you happen to live in Texas, this ain't Texas. And even in Texas, oversizing is stupid. So here's why. The easiest way that I have found to explain um, why right size HVAC is important is asking people, all right, so if you want to take a shower and you have the option between a 10-gallon bucket being dumped over your head all at once or taking a five-minute shower, um, it's the same amount of water either way. Which one would you prefer? It's the same amount of heat delivered. Of course, you want the shower. I mean, duh. Um, so... Uh, it, this is what right size HVAC does. It runs more. It delivers the same amount of heat, but it does it over more time or cool in the summertime. Uh, I have heat on my mind because it's 20 something degrees out today. Uh, we're finally getting in the winter. And here's one of the better illustrations I've seen for mean radiant temperature. So mean it means average in this case. So average radiant temperature. Radiant temperature is the temperature of the surface uh, around us. So we think about forced air here. So this is a uh, kind of an advertisement for uh, water-based heating or radiant heating. It's uh, You can do the same thing with... Uh, forced air that you can with radiators and everything else. Uh, you just have to pay more attention about how you do it. You can't do oversized single stage equipment and get this. You can get this if you use right size variable speed equipment, um, which you're going to get tired of me saying through this. The, the solution is very often right size variable speed equipment. Uh, so, um, forced air heating, you can get all kinds of hot and cold spots. It's not that pleasant. 
Um, what you want is all the temperatures of the surfaces to be very even around you. This makes a place much more pleasant to live. And 60% of human comfort is radiant based. So if you don't solve for this, you're literally missing over half the equation. So if you call yourself a comfort consultant and you don't know what this is, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're missing half the equation. So MRT, mean radiant temperature, start pounding that into your head. This is super important and this relates strongly to load calcs because you want the equipment to run as much as possible and to do that it needs to be right sized and variable speed. Now let's see what mean radiant looks like in reality. So this is a house that I worked on a few years back. Um, before uh, we did any shell upgrades. So you're generally not going to be doing shell upgrades, but I want to show you what they look like. So before we did shell upgrades, this cold spot here, this is a return. The garage is on the other side of this wall. This is a return that goes through the wall and the return was leaky. It was mainly leaky in the attic right above. But you can also see where there's another wall cavity here that's pulling a bunch of air down. Um, so it, this is taken in the winter. And if you haven't looked at much infrared, Cold colors means cold, warm colors means warm. Uh, so there's also a spot over here. Now afterwards, this is what you want. You want a boring infrared picture where everything is basically the same uh, temperature. So you can see this picture here and then this picture over here. So all of those cold spots that you see here, they're gone. Um, like there's the corners not perfect over there. We didn't address that, but we definitely fixed this wall. Uh, this is actually another picture from the same house. This is a knee wall, so there's attic on the other side of this. And uh, so we spray foamed this. And uh, now th this is a little bit of a misnomer because this is taken in the wintertime and this is taken in the summer. Uh, but um, see where this, this all looks like it's the same temperature. That's because you can't see the heat rising out of the house very easily. Um, so over here, we spray foamed the uh, drywall, so the warm parts are now the studs, is what you're seeing here. But note that this knee wall here, and the, uh, which is the same one here, see how this is now all the same temperature? That's what you want to see. So this is bad mean radiant temperature, so you're going to feel these cold spots. I mean, one of the, the easiest ways to think of feeling cold is, have you gone to a restaurant on a cold day, sat next to the window, and notice that you're freezing. Um, that is that window literally sucking heat out of your body. So we want to make it so that uh, our bodies are pretty much in balance with how much heat is around us. And so there you go, I already kind of explained that. All right, so Robert Brearley of Revival Heating and Cooling in Portland. Um, he's a good guy to follow, by the way. He really knows his stuff. Um, so good mean radiant temperature means that every surface in the home is within two to three degrees of the thermostat. This is the quickest and one of the best explanations I've seen for mean radiant temperature. So it's talking about the average of the surface temperatures around us, but ultimately what you want is to get it so all the surface temperatures are within two to three degrees of what the stat says. If you can do that, you're going to have a really comfortable house for your clients. And the best way to do this the six functions of HVAC. The first one is load matching. This is why. Um, good mean radiant temperature is best provided by precisely matching heating and cooling load to HVAC output. So if the house needs 10,000 BTUs of heating, you want to give it 10,000 BTUs of heating, not 20, and definitely not 80, which is what you know a 100K furnace or 80K furnace is going to give you. Um, so precisely matching is important. This basically requires variable speed stuff. This, uh, well, like I said, it's best done, variable speed, right sized. And when you talk about right sized, you're going to find yourself landing in heat pump territory a lot. So maybe it's going to make sense to go full heat pump. Maybe a hybrid will be the, the better solution for the house. But get used to heat pumps. You're going to be using them a lot in the future because if you're trying to load match, like a modulating furnace, the most common one that you'll find of small size is a 60,000 BTU that will ramp down to either 20 or 30,000 BTUs. If you put in a three ton heat pump that goes down to 25%, that goes to 9,000 BTUs. That's 10 or 20,000 BTUs really matters. We're going to see that in a minute, actually. 
Now, if you achieve good MRT, this is the kind of feedback you're going to get. Um, it feels like you put invisible radiators everywhere in my house. So uh, this is one of our electrification clients. We went from a 70,000 BTU furnace to a two ton heat pump. This is still oversized. Um, this is a VNA zero carrier green speed, and it only ramps down to about 50% of full capacity. Um, in retrospect, I gave her the option between the five stage and this. In retrospect, I probably should have recommended the five stage more, uh, but uh, I was surprised she spent the money on this. Uh, and so we pulled her gas meter on her house too. Oh, note too, that there's a sense energy monitor here. You can learn a lot from these. Um, although I'd suggest an Emporia rather than a Sense now. So good mean radiant temperature, it's way easier to achieve when you have a good shell on a house. So good insulation and air sealing. Picture that house that uh, has the big blue streak coming down the wall in the living room. It's really hard to overcome that with HVAC alone because you basically have to blast heat at that one spot, which systems aren't made to do. They just deliver air to the room and they have to figure it out. So if you have a really leaky house, it's very difficult to achieve comfort. So I wonder why the blower door test is part of the HVAC 2.0 comfort consult. Uh-huh, because you need to understand is good MRT even possible with a house. Now, smaller is better. Let's look at some numbers as to why. So this is what's called bin data. Um, so this is how many hours Cleveland, Ohio spends in these various temperature bins. So like on the low side here, you can see minus five to zero Fahrenheit. But note that the fat part is between 25 and about 80. So this is where we spend most of our time. Design temperature is uh, six degrees or five degrees, depending where you look. Um, so right here, look at how much of the year we actually spend at design, not that much. Uh, summer design is 86 uh, or 88, depending where you look. So there's a little bit over here, uh, but this, this really doesn't happen for long. So nighttime cold actually lasts for a while and it doesn't warm up that much. Um, Daytime heat, it's usually only these temperatures for a couple hours in the middle of the day. You know, it's 2 to 5 p.m. and then it starts to cool off a little bit. So, but what we need to do is make sure for load matching that we can handle this range. This is really what matters. So, I ran the numbers on what I consider to be a pretty typical house. So let's say 1,800 square feet. This is Cleveland, Ohio. We've got three ton heating, two ton cooling. Two tons is probably too much, but whatever. Um, uh, so here's how that works. 10,000 BTUs, when you look at how much you need to heat or cool, in these uh, more mild temperatures. If you just have 10,000 BTUs, so basically one ton, that's going to cover you almost 40% of the year. This is a cold climate. And we're talking very little heating and cooling. Um, oop, I'm actually reading that backwards. So less than 10,000 BTUs is uh, actually all you need for 61% of the year. So more than half of the year, you're good. Now your mileage is gonna vary by climate zone. So uh, it, you need to understand what it is. It is. This won't be as high of a number for, say, Minneapolis, but it's going to be a higher number still if you are in, uh, say, Alabama or Florida or anywhere else in climate zones two and three. Now, if you go to 20,000 BTUs, you, you need fewer than 20,000, about 95% of the year. Um, for Cleveland. Again, this is a cold climate. So when if you're considering a three-ton load house, so only 5% of the year do you actually need more than that. So if you're putting in an 80,000 BTU single-stage furnace that puts out 75, something like that, how often does the house need that? Yeah, never. Uh, so that's going to make delivering good mean radiant temperature harder because you are giving them that bucket over the head, not the shower. Um, so don't dump buckets over people's heads. So can you cover the middle? Now let's take a look again. So this is a three ton heating, two ton cooling. Um, what percentage of the year do you need uh, different things? So let's say we put in an 80,000 BTU furnace and it's actually putting out the full 80%. Um, although I guess it doesn't matter. Um, anything over 36. What percentage of the year is it oversized? 100% of the year. It is never the right piece of equipment. 
Um, now, you could find a leaky house that you need 80,000. I'm going to show you one in a little bit. Uh, but uh, this is not the norm. So what if we, we right size it and we install a three ton single stage heat pump? Now, two ton cooling, so we never need three tons of cooling. So we know that there's no cooling in here, but for heating, it's 1% of the year. So why do we even want to put in that piece of equipment if we understand what mean radiant means? Now, let's say we go to, again, right size, the three ton, two stage heat pump. That will let us match the load about a third of the year. So we're doing pretty good. So I mean, that'll do three ton output or two ton output. So pretty good. Not amazing, but pretty good. Now, what if we do a three ton, 25% modulating heat pump? So this is right sized and top of the line. That still only gets us to half of the year for load matching. Um, which is pretty crazy because remember 60% of the year um, we need less than 10,000 BTUs and that this unit only goes to nine. So there's a lot of the year we can't do anything. And then a two ton 25% uh, modulating. So this is actually undersizing the equipment on purpose, which we have done. Um, and oftentimes we recommend doing so. You can make up for the resist uh, make up for the balance with either resistance heat or if you run a hybrid, you can uh, make it up with gas. Uh, but uh, with that system, now we can match the load about 60% of the year. So very important. Okay, so what this shows you though, like even a right size two stage kind of sucks. You know, it's just not that great. Um, uh, the good news is the inverters are coming out left and right. So the Bosch was the first one to come out. That's a non-communicating inverter. And now I'm seeing there are other ones. Luxair just came out with one, which is York. Um, Lennox has one coming out. So we're going to be seeing a lot of these. And I think you're crazy for not, well, at a minimum offering hybrid setups, but probably giving people gentle pushes towards that and letting them know, hey, when things move, like natural gas prices are doubling this winter, we've gotten lazy because it's been a decade of cheap gas prices, but we've seen crazy spikes in the past and now we're seeing one this year. So uh, uh, getting used to heat pumps is going to be very important moving forward. So you know that I'm for electrification, but it's not just for electrification. It's also because it's a good hedge because fuel prices are going to change. Um, important thing here. So when I gave this presentation, a guy came up to me and said, hey, Nate, I, I got a five ton modulating uh, heat pump I'm going to put it in. It's going to be great. And I was like, well, why don't you just wait to see what I have to say? So even if a right size piece of equipment does okay, if you look at, say, a five ton, which is going to get you, you know, somewhere in the middle here, you're only going to be able to match load. Even if it turns way down, it's probably going to be no better than that two stage heat pump. And you're also likely to have static pressure issues because most systems can't handle five tons of airflow. So, um, uh, he came up to me afterwards and said, all right, I'm going to get rid of that. And I'm going to get myself a three ton instead because it was a three ton load. I'm like, all right. So my presentation helped. That was good. Um, now if, you do undersize, um, and for starters, you should have strip heat that can make up the difference. But if you do undersize, the worst case scenario is the temperature on a design day slides a little bit. That actually happened here at this house today because I haven't fixed the shell on this place. So I had it set to 73. When I woke up this morning, it had slid to 70. All it needs is a little bit more heat, or you wait a couple hours. Like it, An hour later, it was back up to temperature. It just needed the sun to come out. Um, and it reduced the load on the house substantially and it caught up. So it, worst case scenario is the temperature slides a couple degrees and you know, if the earth is on fire, the solution is a space heater to the rescue. Um, like it's just not that big of a deal. Five or 10,000 BTUs makes a big difference. Now to achieve this, uh, this is, if you've seen the badass HVAC, um, uh, presentation, which hopefully you have by now. Uh, this is one simple system that does all of this well. So if you put in a nice inverter heat pump 
and then you have resistance back up uh, after it. This gives you your load matching. Uh, this also, uh, if you have reheat, gives you better dehumidification. You run a big drop, that's the bad, big ass drop, um, and you put a big media filter in there and everything is oversized. You run very low pressure on that. You run a fresh air duct into that unit and then to outdoors wherever you can get to it. Um, and then a humidifier depending on your climate. So if you do all of these things, you end up getting that nice load matching piece of equipment. So Badass HVAC, it works best as a, uh, a heat pump only system. You can run it as a hybrid, but if you want good dehumidification, and don't call it Badass unless you have 24-7 dehumidification capability, don't do it. Um, I'll push back on you. Uh, it, to actually get Badass, you need that dehu. So if you do a hybrid, you probably need a separate whole house dehu. Here's an attic version for everyone down south, and you really want to run this in spray foamed attics only. And yes, I know we can move these things around. Um, it's a picture, people. Just trying to give you an idea. Here is the hybrid version where you need a separate dehu. Um, so that's that piece. Okay, so key point through all of this is right sizing is super important, and it's super important for matching load. Uh, all right, so next up, the plus or minus 70% brouhaha. So this was, frankly, a lot of fun. Um, load calc without a blower door test is a waste of time. Changed my mind. Um, as I'm recording this, Jim Bergman, two days ago, uh, put out a video, uh, I think through Corbett Lunsford, saying it, if you don't have a blower door, you don't know what the load of a house is. So ding, but that was the point of this whole thing. Um, it's a bit of an extreme position, but not as extreme as you might think. So uh, we made a few people mad. I thought that some of the memes that came out of it were funny. Um, uh, th this one was definitely my favorite with the tablets. So plus or minus 70%, it's mostly related to the air leakage and the blower door. Um, so if you don't know the leakage of a house, it can kick your butt. So here's the chart that we started off with, and this is the house that I was thinking of as that chart happened. So this is uh, Wrightsoft calculation from Mark Perina in Rochester, New York. So, and I, I know this client, uh, we correspond regularly. Um, that happens with early clients. Uh, and so he has about 1,800 square foot house. And this is the load calc if it had a 6,000 CFM 50 leakage, which matches the 70,000 uh, furnace according to, well, close enough. Um, uh, so, I mean, it's 70,000. 80% is going to give you about 60 output, you know, 56, something right in that ballpark. So the house has to be fairly leaky. So remember, a one-to-one -one ratio is where things start to get controllable for most homes. Not all homes, but that's where things start to get good enough. Uh, so this uh, required a little over a three-to-one ratio to match the equipment that it used to have. Now, if we take that same house and we make it 800 cubic feet per minute, which is uh, CFM 50, that's that's pretty tight, uh, but this house happens to be there. So we go from, so here we're basically at 60,000 load, here we're at 30, and then cooling we're about a ton. Uh, so this is very close to what actuality is for that house. It's actually, it's a touch tighter now, I think he has it down to 650, something like that. So I asked him to give me sense data on his house. Uh, so this is an energy monitor to see uh, when the house slid, because that's how you can tell uh, when you have an issue. So he actually kept his furnace and just stacked a Bosch heat pump on top. That's what this house got. And he has it clicked to two ton, um, not uh, the three. And so uh, this is the runtime on a cold day. So it's a design day. Design in Rochester is basically the same as Cleveland, so it's five or six. So it was a three degree low that day, and the unit ran flat out. So look, you can see it was running all day. Um, and uh, he told me that the temperature in the house drooped from 68 to 66. So again, there's that one space heater away thing. Um, here I am to save the day, the space heater flying in to save the burning earth. Um, <laughs> people worry too much about this stuff. Uh, so uh, it slid a little bit. Now I do want to call out, this is the defrost cycle. So this is what they look like. 
Um, and now I have a Bosch on this place too, so I'm noticing the same thing. Uh, so you get these little double dips, and then it takes off again. So see where there's a double dips? I forget what the all of this was. Oh, this is 24 hours, so it did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight defrost cycles for the day. Um, now it's super cold out, so when it's cold out, you don't need as much defrost because there's not as much moisture in the air. Uh, but in any case, curious to see what that looks like. So I can't recommend enough. Just go measure stuff that you have no idea what you're going to learn. So put in energy monitors. The Emporia View is 150 bucks. It's a pretty decent monitor. Um, this is a sense. It's 300. Um, it's supposed to pick up different signals. It doesn't do it nearly as well as was promised. Uh, so I've largely moved away from this. But also get uh, air quality monitors. Uh, there's there's a number of them out there. There's the the best one that I like right now is definitely the Haven Zoa. Um, it was their, they actually care about feedback and they're trying to solve problems, which is really nice. Uh, but the more you can learn about things, the better. And we'll come into Echobees in a little bit as well. Okay, so I knew uh, where his output was because I went and looked at the expanded performance data for uh, his BOVA. Um, this is the Bosch. So if you look at five degrees out, which is where they have it, um, all of these, if you look at them, so we're in the 18,000 BTU range or thereabouts. Um, well, heck, even 75 return, we're at 15,000 uh, BTUs. So we know that it's putting out between 16 and 18,000 BTUs uh, at five degrees. So since we know that it slid right as it was getting to that range, the actual load on that house is not the 30,000 that we saw in Manjay. It's closer to 18. Now, flipping to a leaky house instead, this is a house where uh, I did an audit on a very cold day. So you can see 15 degree outdoor temperature and it was below that. It was like 10 degrees. Um, I was just writing down uh, measurements of the house as I was walking around and it was so cold that my hands were freezing. I couldn't wear gloves because I had to write things down. So I had to go in and out a couple times. It was a cold day that was still a touch above design. Um, but this is an Echobee chart, so uh, this orange is when the furnace is running, and then the gray is when the fan is running. Uh, so this was a pretty dumb system. It was a crummy Goodman that was installed really badly. <laughs> um, it was a very bad install. Uh, but uh, uh, this house was quite leaky. So 2,000 square feet, and this was 5,500, 6,000 blower door. Um, oh, here we are, 2,100 square feet, 5,300 uh, blower door, and 80%, 85% furnace, or 80,000 BTU, 85%. So note here, I turned up the temperature quite a bit and just let it rip to see what would happen. Uh, so this unit was putting out about 65,000 BTUs, and... Uh, it really didn't move the temperature. See how slowly it's creeping up? Like, this is over a long time. This is a couple of hours. Uh, well, let's see. So, 1 o'clock to 4 o'clock. So, 3 hours, and it was a sunny day, and it barely moved the temperature. So, what this tells us is the load of this house is basically the output of the furnace. So, you know how I say you want to know the blower door? Um, this is why if you put a heat pump in this house, you would get crushed by phone calls from uh, an unhappy customer. Now, I threw this into uh, EDS. Um, uh, this is the auditor tool and just had it spit out what came back. And this is not that far off from reality. So this is showing about a 75,000 load at five degrees. And so since we know that the load is 65,000 at 15, because it barely wasn't moving or barely was moving up when I asked it to heat up, uh, that shows us something that's that's pretty tricky. So I think it's probably actually a bit higher than 75,000. And here's why. In our experience, if you have a leaky house, 
and you're talking normal temperatures, if you get down to like 50 degrees or something like that, like there's some difference between a leaky house and a tight house. But when you start getting into the cold temperatures, stack effect starts picking up and it starts sucking cold air in the bottom of the house and shooting it up through it. And stack effect makes loads go geometric. So instead of it being a linear function, it gets geometric. So it's like it's squared or cubed or something like that. Um, my bet is it's about one, one and a half power. Uh, it's not the easiest data to collect to figure out. <clears throat> but uh, for sure, when you get into a leaky house and extreme conditions, stack effect takes over and load goes up very quickly. So that's what we were seeing on that leaky house. In the summertime, the same thing happens. Leaky houses, their load goes up very quickly too. So if you can get a house relatively tight or well insulated, you'll find that its load is far more linear. And by the way, I just made all these up. Um, so if somebody wonders where I got the data from, I didn't. This is gut from watching a whole lot of houses. And I wanted to see, hey, uh, can I get somebody else to come in and verify? So Shauna, who's a good friend of mine up in Canada, uh, she does all kinds of crazy stuff with building performance and actually has a, a really nice training tool for learning building shell um, that may be worth considering if you continue diving into 2.0. Um, and she uh, corroborated that, yeah, when, when houses are leaky, things happen. So Twitter can be nice for peer review. Now here's another way to look at it. This is something that Rocky Mountain Institute did, or RMI. They modeled, this was before the Texas, um, what was that, Valentine's Day this year, uh, before that big freeze, they modeled what happened if you shut the, the heat off in a house with various insulation and air sealing levels and then put it through a very cold spell. So like this is very cold. So we're falling from um, uh, the teens, which is already quite cold, and then staying below zero for a week and seeing what happens. So if we have old school, you probably won't be able to see this because my face will be blocking it, but uh, this is 1950 insulation. Note after 24 hours, the inside of that house is down to 20 degrees. That's not good. Um, but see how quick that, that fall is. And this is our experience. You get a leaky house and you shut off the heat and boom, they, they fall off a cliff. This is 1980 standards. Uh, blue is 2009 code. Uh, the yellow is net zero energy ready, which is a pretty tight thing. It's on, honestly, you're not going to get a retrofit there without doing crazy things, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of work. And then passive house, which is known for being super insulated, is super helpful. So you shut off the heat in a passive house and, geez, what is it? A full week later, it's still 40 degrees inside the house. So certainly ain't comfy but you can survive uh, when you consider that outdoors is below zero. So this is kind of a, a helpful way to look at it. So how long is it safe to be in a house? And basically once the, the inside of a house falls below 40, things are not good anymore. Uh, so you've got about 24 hours in a 1980 uh, code insulated house. So if we can get better shells on these houses, they, they take a lot longer to fall, and we've definitely seen this. So let's look at the actual numbers. So I showed you that the actual load on the house from seeing when the heat pump lost the war uh, is about 18,000 BTUs, might even be 16. So that is at five degrees Fahrenheit. Now the load in Manjay came back at 70,000, well, it was actually 60,000, but it required a 70,000 BTU furnace uh, to do so. So in between those is 44,000. So if you take 44,000 plus or minus 70% on the bottom, you get 14,000. Um, and so the actual number was 18. And on the high side, you get 70. So it's not quite that wide, but when I said plus or minus 70%, again, I meant it half jokingly. Uh, and I also didn't run the number. It was just my gut thinking about this exact house and other experiences that I've had. So if you go to a colder climate, say Minneapolis, you are for sure going to see a uh, man J where you can swing it, or, well, or the actual load calc, you can swing it plus or minus 70%. Now, if you are down south, 
you may only be talking about plus or minus a ton, but plus or minus a ton, it's still the wrong equipment. Um, so you really want to know how do you size that correctly. Um, and again, if, if the house is leaky, it can really bite you in the butt like you're seeing there. So, uh, thanks again to Brearley, Robert Brearley, for this one. HVAC guys, selecting their infiltration numbers without a blower door. Um, you're guessing. It's a lottery. It may bite you in the butt. It may not. Um, uh, but I sure wouldn't want to own it without at least offering a test. If you offer a blower door test through a comfort consult and somebody declines it and there's a problem, you point back to that. Um, and they get to figure out what to do. So, thanks to Sam Myers for this one. Uh, this cracks me up. Uh, okay, so that's the plus or minus 70% thing. Can it be plus or minus 70%? Uh-huh. Um, is it always? No. Um, so the key words there were supposed to be up to plus or minus 70%. Uh, but uh, even if you're off by a ton, you're still putting the wrong piece of equipment in. So keep that in mind. All right, real world load calcs. There are a couple of different ways to look at things that are happening and then figure out what the load on that house is. So I'm going to walk you through these. So the first one, we are going to talk about Bill Russell's house, a uh, curious HVAC guy, one of the HVAC overtime hosts. So I did a comfort consult on his house back in January of this year. Uh, I'm recording in December. And uh, I got his gas bill and his gas bill was so pretty. I'm just like, Hey, can I use this for a presentation? Cause this is really nice to, to teach with. So, uh, you're going to see this elsewhere. This is part of energy bill disaggregation, which means just taking it apart and then figuring out, uh, like how much was used for water heat, how much was used for space heat, how much was used for say the dryer, um, how much electricity was used elsewhere in the house. So you can pull things apart and figure out where usage is going. So uh, for gas, this house is crazy easy. It has a gas water heater and a gas boiler. That's it. And so you can just look at the low months and that's going to be your water heat. So the low months are all right around one MCF or that's the same basically as 10 therms. So that is your baseline. So then all you do is you multiply that baseline times 12. So one MCF times 12 is 12 MCF or 120 therms. Now you add up what the total usage is for the year and you subtract out 120. Uh, so the house uses 137 and a half MCF or 1375 therms. And if you subtract out the water heat, we're down to 1255 therms a year or 125.5 MCF. And MCF, by the way, that is 1,000 cubic feet. Uh, therm is basically um, 100 cubic feet or a CCF. It's not exactly, but it's plus or minus about 3%. Uh, it's close enough for government work because on load calcs, we aren't going to get uh, even to plus or minus 3. We're going to get to plus or minus 10%. Um, usually at best. So I have a separate video on this one, but you can use rights off for free, sort of. Um, it's good for backing into loads. So I'm just going to run through this really quickly with um, uh, Bill's house here. So here's what the screen came up looking for me when I first ran his calc. So you have to put in the zip code. <clears throat> and then I always change the the energy cost to either a dollar or 10 cents. So that makes it super easy. I'll show you why in a minute. So we change all of these. Um, oh, that's funny. And then I screenshotted not changing them. So this should go to 10 cents, but that definitely needs to go to a uh, dollar per therm because really we're only calculating for heating. But if you change this to 10 cents uh, for cooling, it will also be helpful. It'll show you what the usage is for cooling. So uh, for the base system, you go select gas furnace. There is no boiler option. So I had to work with this and he has an 84% efficient boiler. So that's what I selected. And at 44,000 BTUs, he is using 1,079 therms. So, and I know this because the gas cost is at a dollar. Um, so uh, $1,079 is 1,079 therms. That's too low because we have to get to 1,255. So we move... Uh, whatever we need to do to get to 1255 and what you do there, I walked it up and it's right about 51,000 BTUs. And by the way, this was corroborated by experience because the day I was there, it was about 15 degrees and 
We had the boiler off for a couple of hours while we were running blower door. We dropped the house from 70 to 50 and it came back up to 70 very quickly, like very quickly. Um, and uh, so I figured that the load on that house, because the boiler had 80 or 90,000 BTU output, was in the 50 to 60 range. And this corroborated that. So what we just did here, we just figured out real world load by using energy use to back into uh, the load. So, and again, I've got a more detailed video on this. Now, important piece of this, if you're calculating from usage, this is close but not perfect. This is climate dependent. Um, this doesn't take into a f uh, account leaky rooms or leaky houses. This is far better for tighter homes. So here's my general way of looking at it. So say uh, you have energy use on one side of the uh, spectrum and man J on the other. If you have a really leaky house, you probably want to size closer to man J. Yeah, so that's a three to one ratio. That's a very leaky house. Two to one is pretty leaky. You're probably going to size somewhere in the middle of the two. You get down to a very tight house. You can basically size right on energy use because again, we are, uh, uh, we've got that linear function, not the geometric one that we're working with. And for figuring out how to get your load calcs accurate, uh, there are these pieces of the puzzle. So uh, if you want to be inaccurate, you start off with, I've been doing this for 30 years. Um, I don't believe you. <laughs> you haven't tested anything. You haven't checked anything. Man J typically is not very accurate. Like there's, there's a lot of stuff you don't know. Um, energy use gets you pretty decent. If you have design day runtime, which we're going to look at shortly, uh, by using an Echo B or uh, an 824 or 1050 train, those will get you pretty stinking close. And then it, the problem is you usually don't have these and you have to have it in on a cold day or a hot day or you don't know. Uh, so realistically, if you have blower door, energy use, and client set points, all of which are uh, collected in the comfort console, um, you can have pretty high certainty that you're sizing correctly. Now, uh, it, by the way, you can also do system comparisons with this tool, which I'll touch on as well. So you can change cost to where things actually should be. These are both hybrids, but this one leans on the furnace. This one leads on the heat pump. And then uh, this is a heat pump only system. Uh, so I threw this in here so everyone knows that I like electrification because I think long term we're going to get cheaper electricity. Um, well, we're already beginning to see it in a lot of fronts. Um, but the heat pump only system for Bill's house actually costs 300 bucks a year more. So electrification checkmate, right? Well, maybe. Um, check your meter fee. So in Cleveland, it costs $350 a year just to have the meter. So that washes out this if you can uh, get rid of the meter. And so if the water heater is on the table for changing as well, it could be an opportunity. And then you'll be down to the stove and the dryer in most homes. Now, when I recorded this gas prices, or when I first uh, performed this, gas prices had been stable for a decade. Right now, uh, gas prices have, and meaning natural gas or methane, uh, prices have doubled for this winter, which means that heat pumps are the cheapest way to heat in most markets. So if you have an air conditioner, guess what? You're screwed. You don't have an option. Um, if you have a hybrid, you can change settings and lean it harder on the heat pump than the furnace. Um, so, uh, I just found this whole thing funny. Uh, if you hate pipelines, do your, uh, part and turn off the gas to your home. Yeah, it's, we're, we're pretty good at doing that. So it's a friend of mine, Andy Kosick, and he did it. So there's a picture of his house. All right. So mean radiant, just touching on that. This is what right sizing does. Um, now from runtime charts, we already kind of looked at this. So we knew that because that furnace was running flat out and it really wasn't moving the temperature and it was putting out 65,000 BTUs because furnaces put out the same amount of heat very close regardless of temperature. So heat pumps vary a ton in their output. Furnaces pretty much put out the same amount um, uh, regardless of outdoor temperature. So we knew that that was there. Um, now, because th we were above design and the furnace was already not keeping up, um, what is the actual load? I don't know. I'd guess around 80,000. 
uh, for that house. So it's a leaky house. They can kick your butt. Now let's look at a formerly leaky house. So this is one of the first projects that I did using what has now become the HVAC 2.0 CPP, um, the comprehensive planning process. Uh, so this house we didn't touch HVAC. This was all shell. So it had a 60,000 BTU, 94% efficient two-stage furnace, um, and it's 2,300 square feet, um, 3,300 blower door, and it started at about 6,000. So this was after a bunch of shell work. And note, this isn't that great. That's a one and a half to one, or 1.4 to one, something like that. It's not that great. The man J on this house came in at 67,000 BTUs. The tight load, as I call it, and this wasn't truly a man J, it was out of a program called Treat, which is uh, used by New York State. That's where it kind of originated. But it's very close to man J. You can pull out a bunch of fudge factors and uh, get what we call the tight load, and that was 43,000 BTUs for this house. But let's see what actually happened. Uh, so this is, uh, now you can't get this, it's through the contractor portal of Ecobee that they just killed. Uh, but uh, this is the coldest February uh, morning on record in Cleveland. So pretty intense. We got down to, well, what does it say, minus 11. And like at my house, I was up this morning, uh, this particular morning, and it was minus 20. My car did not want to start. So 67 man J, <clears throat> um, and this furnace puts out 57,000 BTUs on high, 38 on low. Design is five degrees. So note design is right around here. And then we dip substantially below design for this little period. And just to show, yes, it was uh, cold. Um, so that's the coldest February temperature um, hitting minus 17 and the fourth coldest low ever. So that's that's as cold as Cleveland gets. But note, so this is how this works. Light red is low stage. Dark red is high stage. So 38,000 BTUs, it shut off um, when it was at design. So that 67,000 BTU man J, we know it's wrong. Um, the 43, the tighter one, we know that's wrong too because it's still carrying. Now, when we got down to minus five, the 38,000 was actually still carrying it, uh, which is kind of crazy. Um, and uh, so that shows us that things are off. So what this ends up telling us is we can interpolate that the actual load at design for this house is somewhere in the 30,000 BTU range which is crazy. Here's a 2,300 square foot, 1959 house in Cleveland that can be heated with three tons. Um, now, obviously, uh, most heat pumps are going to be putting three tons out at that point, although there's there's a bunch of them coming now. Um, so the hyperheat models will at those temperatures. So you wouldn't expect a 2,300 square foot house to be three tons. But when I saw this, guess what? I got a lot of guts here moving forward. So you just want to know what's going on. Now, this house has a three-ton air conditioner, so these are design days for us, so we got up to around 90 degrees, and look, it ran for a few hours, but then it shut off, so this three-ton is still way oversized for it. And uh, just to make note, so here's December one year and December the next year. Um, and relatively similar years. I mean, it's, it's a bit warmer for uh, 2014 in this case. But uh, when I normalized that to heating degree days, how cold it was, it was a 47% gas usage reduction, and that held through the winter. Came out 46 or 47% drop in usage. Uh, so that house, if we plug that in, 30,000 BTU heating, 18,000 cooling and 44118. That's the zip code for where this house is, University Heights, uh, Ohio, near Cleveland. The heat pump actually saves money at the prices we had at that point. So 80 cent therms, 13 cent kilowatt hours. Now these numbers are up a little bit, but uh, uh, it's just wild to see that a heat pump actually penciled out better. So that is how we use. Um, runtime charts to interpolate and see what's going on.
Now we already showed expanded performance charts. So you got to go find your expanded performance chart and then uh, you are going to look at whatever temperature is most relevant. So five degree design for Rochester, New York. We know that that unit was putting out somewhere between 16 and 18,000 BTUs and it only started losing the war at this point. So that is basically the load of the house. So you look to see where the, the house loses the war and then you go from there. But let's look at another one. So this is uh, one of our very first electrifications. Um, this is also this is Cleveland Heights. House is 1918. We put a three ton green speed. It's a VNA zero in this one. And here's the Man J. So this comes out of the treat program I mentioned. Man J was about 51,000 BTUs. So when we wanted to put a three ton into this house, the uh, HVAC contractor we were working with then, uh, they kind of had a cow. <laughs> They didn't like that, and the supply house didn't like it either. They wanted to jam a four-ton in there. This house didn't have enough ductwork for three, let alone four, so it's a good thing we didn't do the four. Uh, but you, if you look at the block loads, first floor, 15,000, second floor, 12,000, were about 28,000 BTU block load for heating those two at design. Now this one was fun. I locked resistance out down to five degrees to see what would happen. And the house would slide below seven during the day because there was some solar load and it would slide below 14 at night. So if we knew that it would slide uh, at a little over 10 degrees, 26,000 BTUs uh, is the output at 10 degrees. So this is expanded performance data for that green speed. Um, so it's putting out 26,000 at 10 degrees. And so what this helped tell us was our models, because we had trued to energy use, were pretty close. So 26,000 at 10 degrees is the real world load calc versus 27,000 at five. So we're, we're close enough for government work. That helped us understand. And this house got reasonably tight again. So it wasn't crazy, but this house started at, geez, it was six or 7,000. And we got it down to about 1,800 CFM 50 blower door. Um, and so that is how you can play with the charts. Okay, so that's it. We went over real-world uh, load calcs from usage, from runtime charts, and from expanded performance data. Uh, so um, it, when it comes to op cost, I've got a full video on that, and uh, if we get requests for the other stuff, I can do full videos on those too. But uh, this is a lot of information to take in, but it's important. Uh, so load calcs, there's, there's a whole lot of things to do. Now, the real-world load calcs, what's the point? The point is we want uh, reconciliation points. Um, so uh, this is typically an accounting form or term where uh, you make sure that numbers balance multiple ways. Or you could also look at it as triangulation. Um, so if you try three different methods and you come up with a, basically the same number, you can be pretty certain of that number. If you try three different methods and two of them are way far apart, you got to figure out what's going on. So this is what we're trying to do with real world load calcs is understand are the load calcs correct and what can we actually do. So we played with that from usage. So here's Bill's house. Showed you that from runtime charts, we could figure out that this house was about 30,000 BTUs uh, at design in Cleveland versus a 67,000 BTU Man J. So when I say you can discount 30 to 60%, this is one of the houses I'm thinking of in my mind. And then from expanded performance charts, um, you can uh, figure out what it is, but you have to know when it slides. So as I'm recording this tonight, I'm going to be talking to AT team Adam. He has set up a whole bunch of Echobees and he turned the gas uh, valve off for a bunch of uh, hybrid systems. And then he got to see when they slid. So he's learning a lot. And we're going to learn too, because I'm going to record that. That'll be, uh, hopefully become part of all this training. All right, so here's what we we covered. Smaller is better. Mean radiant temperature wins when it comes to comfort. Plus or minus 70%. It's a bit of a stretch, but it's not a lot of a stretch. Um, remember, it should be up to not plus or minus 70. And then I showed you how to do real world load calcs. So smaller is better. Remember bin data, um, and I highly encourage you to go figure out how to get this data. You can get it from NOAA um, because you will learn a lot. And actually, we have a tool that uh, will be 
uh, part of this training as well, where you can see ballpark what the loads are at different outdoor temperatures, so you can learn what your bins are. And most of the year, you don't need much heating or cooling. Oversized variable speed stuff does not save you. So if you're like, ah, it's about a three-ton load, let's throw a four-ton variable in. No. If you do, and you've seen this, and it bites you, don't blame me. It wasn't me. That was all you. Here's our plus or minus 70. It's pretty close. And then we talked about load calculation accuracy and how... Uh, blower door energy use and set points is kind of your best way. So uh, these were slides that I, I had in for the, the Florida presentation, but do you want to reduce the risk of sizing aggressively? So you want to offer blower door testing and accurate load calcs. That's what the Comfort Consult does. So they don't have to do it, but you better offer. Um, and you can use these techniques and other uh, quick-to-use software. So cool calc can also be useful for this, so I'll be doing a video on that. And if you offer and decline testing and they decline... Uh, you're off the hook. And the blower door testing, again, it's all part of 2.0. And of course, you should be giving HVAC 101 out already to everyone that you come in contact with because that's going to be helpful. And that is intro to load calcs. So you're probably going to need to watch this again. That's totally fine. Um, and there will be more videos. So if something here isn't quite hitting you the same way, I'll be teaching it in a slightly different way as well coming up. So hope this was helpful. I'll see you on the next one. I'm Nate Adams. Bye-bye.